All right. How y'all doing today? Oh, come on now. You all can do better than that. How y'all doing today? Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, I'm going to uh, start this off with a welcome, welcome, welcome on behalf of the School of Engineering, the School of Information and Computer Sciences, and the School of Physical Sciences. I just want to thank you all for coming and spending some time with us today. This is our third annual uh, fall alumni event, and it already promises uh, to be a great one. What do you think of the venue? Pretty nice? Well, uh, these events don't happen without the hard work of some really, really dedicated people, led by our very own Kristen Hurth. Please give her a round of applause. And uh, will all of our development staff, our communication staff and the like, will all of you please stand for all schools, please stand and formally be recognized now. Please, so where are y'all? Wave your hands. These are the people that make it happen. I honestly say this every year, uh, and, I, and, I, and I say it every year because every year is true. The value of your degree has never been worth more than it is today. The value of the degrees that you all have received uh, from these three schools has never, it's never been worth more than it is today, and I can prove it. Uh, just this past year, uh, the, actually the, the article came out last month even, uh, Money Magazine takes a look across the country and they highlight what they call the best value universities. And uh, they take into account items like cost of education they, in terms of the tuition. They take uh, entities uh, like uh, the number of students who come from lower income families who are on Pell Grants and the like. And then they take into account one extraordinarily important piece of information that relates to everybody in this room. They look at the salaries and the outcomes of the graduates. And when you put all of this together and look at the metrics the institution that is the highest ranked institution in the whole country at doing the most for the American dream is guess what? University of California Irvine. And that's because of you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Look, this is actually the first year, it's the first year that a public institution has won this award. Believe it or not, that award is normally won by schools the likes of Harvard or Yale or Princeton and the like. But this is the first time a public has won it. And interestingly enough, that public just happens uh, to be us. And so it is a really, really big deal. I say that to say you all are doing extraordinarily well. You're making lots of money. So this year on October 4th, October 4th is the kickoff of our fall campaign. And we look to leverage some of that greatness that UCI has given you in terms of you giving back to us in, 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 uh, on the October 4th. I will tell you it's been a great year for engineering. We have uh, done extraordinarily well as a school. We've had another great year. Uh, our school is now... 3,978 students. Uh, so we are inching very, very close to 4,000. And it's not with the freshmen that will be starting in a few weeks. We will be over the 4,000 mark uh, for sure this year. Uh, and so we continue to grow. That's the largest we've ever been. We, uh, our research productivity is highest that it's ever been in our history. And we're up by more than 10% over last year. Uh, and it's not just our undergraduates are up, our graduate uh, PhD numbers are the highest they've ever been in their history as well. And uh, we hired 15 faculty last year. 
which is extraordinary. And uh, we now have our faculty numbers. They're, they're the largest that they've ever been as well. And so all of those outcomes are great, but our faculty are doing great things. Uh, we just had a, a faculty member have a breakthrough in developing the next generation of what we call beyond 5G technology. And so we haven't even rolled out 5G yet uh, nationally that's coming, but we already have transceivers that are capable of 2x what you're going to get from 5G. And that work has been developed here at UCI. Uh, I can go on and on. We have a, a new detection mechanism for looking at chronic fatigue syndrome. It's another UCI invention. They, and, and, and so we're hiring these really great people, and they're producing great outcomes. And I am, really, I am very, very proud of that. But I'm also proud of the fact that we're doing it in what we call a, a, an environment of inclusive excellence. And what do I mean when I say inclusive excellence? I mean that our student body, our population, our faculty are now starting to look like the representatives of the state of California. Uh, we are now over 25% female faculty, uh, which is substantially higher than the national average. Our uh, our, our leadership in the school uh, is, uh, if, you, if you look at our leadership team, our leadership team is 50% or so uh, female and underrepresented. And, uh, and that's a big thing for an engineering program. And so we've had tremendous outcomes. I feel really uh, good about it. Um, there is, I, I am hard pressed to find a metric that isn't up. We, the, the number she's going up every year, uh, and that also, we're not just taking in record numbers of students, the quality of those record number of students are high too. And uh, these three schools, engineering, information and computer sciences, and physical science, if you combine them together, you're looking at about 35% of the applicants, so actually over 35% of the applicants uh, to this institution apply to these three schools. And so we are a big important part of the whole thing. And we just took in the brightest and most talented cohort of students our campus has ever seen. And the only thing I can guarantee is that next year the students will be smarter. And so it's just a really a good thing and really a good time to be a part of this program. And so we continue to thrive in lots of ways. If you want to know more, I can talk all day about this, but that's something that I don't have. I am going to now uh, bring to the stage uh, to talk to you today about what's happening in information and computer sciences, Dean Marios Papaythemiu. And see, I finally got that right after, did I get it right, Marios? Outstanding. Dean Marios Papaythemiu from the School of Information and Computer Sciences. Thank you, Greg. I, I will say this was perfect. This, this was better than what I can do, so thank you. <laughs> so you know that we have the three tenors uh, in front of you, right? The deans from engineering, physical sciences, ICS. I used to be the junior one. Um, I, I want to believe after Ken Chandler's retirement, I may not be the junior one, but I want to believe that I'm still the junior one. So we are parading in front of you in the reverse alphabetical order. So Dean Washington was first, I'm second, I start with a P. I will have the pleasure of introducing, when I'm done with my uh, speed here, I will have the pleasure of introducing the, uh, the new Dean of uh, Physical Sciences, the School of Physical Sciences, James Bullock. Uh, let me go through my notes. I, I have a super-sized font in front of me because I'm known to be a little bit challenged with my eyesight. Um, I'll tell you one thing, right? April 15 is a very bad day for me. And it's not because of IRS. It's not because I'm doing my taxes on April 15. I don't do my taxes on April 15. I always file for an extension. And the reason, <laughs> the reason is on April 15, I get a lot of you know, hate mail in my, in my mailbox. And, and this year was a particularly bad one because that's when the admission offers go out to our students. 
And that's when you get a lot of the really outstanding students who apply to our programs who, who get uh, pretty negative news. Basically, they didn't get in. Uh, this year, ICS had a record number of applicants. For our undergraduate programs, we had more than 10,000 applicants. For our graduate programs, master's and PhD, we had close to 6,000 applicants. Among the undergrads, only one in six got an offer, which is the most competitive ever. I think we had the highest GPA and the highest SAT among all schools, but I'm sure Greg and, and James will have the same claim. Uh, <laughs> we're all above average. And a similar story with our uh, 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 graduate programs, approximately one in 10 among the, the graduate applicants in the PhD program, even less than that, got an offer. So it's extremely competitive. Nevertheless, the program has grown. Uh, the growth has been unprecedented. I've been the dean for two and a half years. The growth started before my time. We have 33, 3,400 undergraduate students across all our majors. We have more than 800 graduate students, 300 of them are PhD students, approximately 500 of them are master's students. Uh, a lot of growth in our professional programs. There is a one-year professional program in computer science, one in human, and, uh, human computer interaction and design. There's a new one that's starting in software engineering. There's another one in the pipeline for next year in data science. So uh, the demand is enormous. We try to keep up with the demand. We, we, we accept, we admit as many students as we can, but we're still lagging behind. I think what Greg is saying is a true statement. I'm a biased observer, obviously, but I think it is true. Uh, the news are spreading. Uh, the programs are really strong and they're, they're getting the reputation is, is, is sort of catching up with the excellence that we have uh, in, our, in our schools. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah, tenure track. We have a lot of students coming in. We have a lot of faculty. We hired 30 faculty, 30 new faculty in three years. It's not all my doing, obviously, but I try to play a role. Uh, the school has 97 tenure track faculty as of fall of 2019, which is, you know, next month. We're almost, we're just three faculty shy of 100 faculty. That's a record high. Uh, we grew by almost 50% within four years. This is astronomical growth by, by computer science standards. You know very well how competitive it is out there. We hired in all the areas that you would expect. Of course, we hired in artificial intelligence. Of course, we hired in big data. Of course, we, we hired in health informatics, which are all areas of high impact. By the way, if you don't know how to solve a Rubik's Cube, don't bother. We have, we have one of, my, of our machine learning experts who, who published a paper a reinforcement learning algorithm will do it for you. It will just figure it out by itself. You don't have to teach it. You can show off to your friends. The thing solves the Rubik's, the Rubik's Cube by itself in 27 moves on the average. Scramble the thing in whatever arbitrary way you want. Most of the time, on the average, I should say, 27 moves is all it takes to solve the Rubik's Cube. And it does so by itself. Nobody teaches the algorithm how to do that. It's pretty fascinating if you think about it. Computer science is, is the second largest undergraduate major on campus. I don't know what's the number one major, but it's not going to be number one for too long. We're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Yes, yes, we're really selective. In fact, embarrassingly so. Uh, graduate student fellowships, there were 13 National Science Foundation graduate student fellowships that were given to statisticians. This past year, you all know that we have three departments in the school. There is a computer science department, as you would expect. There's an informatics department and a statistics department. Uh, the National Science Foundation gave 13 graduate fellowships to all statistics PhD students across the nation. Uh, guess how many of them landed at UCI, our own statistics department? I'll give you three choices. One, how many people say one? Nobody, good. How many people say three? Nobody. Okay, okay, we have one person here to the street. Good. How many people say five? Two people say five. Okay, so the answer is three out of 13. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, James really proved that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, he has insider information. So let's see, what else do I have, do I have here? Yes, our students, uh, enormous demand to get into the school, enormous demand from our corporate uh, recruiters, our corporate sponsors. Uh, just to give you, you know, a date, obviously, Greg mentioned the October 4th kickoff for the capital campaign. Um, 
there is another date I want to plant in your minds. October 16th is the ICS Career Fair. We don't really call it as such. It's really the ICS showcase, which is for the full day before the STEM Career Fair. Corporate sponsors come in and say, how do I get your best students? We tell them, we're going to dedicate the full day for you to do so. So we're putting a program together for all our corporate recruiters. If you're one of them, uh, keep that in mind. If you're not one of them, make sure you become one of them. Please join us on the 16th of October. What else do I have? Not much. As, as Greg said, I can be here for hours, but we don't have hours in front of us. Let me take the next couple of minutes to introduce uh, James. Uh, James Bullock is the brand new dean of the UCI School of Physical Sciences. Uh, he came to UCI in 2004, and he has been a leading force on campus ever since. Previous to becoming dean, he served as chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. From 2005 to 2017, he was director of the Center of Cosmology. So Greg and I deal with things that are kind of down to earth. James goes up beyond the stratosphere, right? Uh, he looks, he's looking way, way far. Uh, prior to coming to UCI, he was a postdoctoral fellow at, at Harvard Observatory and Ohio State. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Physics and Mathematics at Ohio State University and his PhD in Physics at UC Santa Cruz. James studies how galaxies and their constituent dark matter halos form and evolve over billions of years. In fact, now that I know that, I have some questions for James because I was reading about that uh, a few months ago. By analyzing data that astronomers have collected using the Hubble Space Telescope, the Keck Observatory, and other ground and space telescopes, James concentrates on understanding how galaxies, including the Milky Way and its local group of galaxies, emerged from the primordial universe. James has been featured on various TV shows. If he looks familiar, it's because he is familiar. Uh, he, was, he, he, he has participated, he has been featured on the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, PBS Southern California, and you will catch him on the current season of how the universe works on the Science Channel. James, please. Everybody, this is great. This has been so much fun. I have to say, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here as the new dean of School of Physical Sciences. Marios and Greg have just been awesome uh, the whole way through in welcoming me. So thanks very much. You know, it's so much fun being the dean. And the one word I would say is inspirational. You know, it's been tonight itself as a as a perfect example of that inspiration. I mean, I've got a chance to reconnect and meet alums from all three schools, and what a fabulous group. Um, and I hope you're all similarly inspired by getting to meet each other and find out what's going on. I mean, this has just been a fantastic, a, a fantastic night so far. So thanks, everybody. Um, I'll say a couple things about the school. I mean, the amazing thing about stepping in uh, as the new dean of this school is I'm walking in footsteps that are really, uh, it's really hallowed ground. Um, the founding dean of this school is a guy named Fred Rhinus, uh, who's sort of a luminary. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in physics for discovering a particle called the neutrino that maybe some of you have heard of. Now, the neutrino, uh, originally, the people who invented the idea thought that this particle would be impossible to discover, so weakly interacting that nobody would ever be able to find it. Uh, and Fred Rhinus set out to actually detect the thing, detect the undetectable, partially because everybody told him it couldn't be done. Now, that spirit right, that founding spirit to do the impossible, to tackle extremely hard problems and solve them is still there, right? It's still alive in what we're trying to do on this campus today. Among the many really important problems we're trying to solve in the School of Physical Sciences involves the future of the climate and the future of energy. So many of you also may know that the first department of its kind in the world is our Department of Earths and Sciences which is dedicated to understanding the climate, the environment on a global scale. What are humans doing? And what is the future of sea level rise, glacier melt, the future of ocean health and, and wildfires in California and all of the world, including the Amazon? Part of that mission is to prepare for the inevitable. But another part of our mission is to try to figure out fundamental solutions to how we're going to power this world. 
So we have, the, many of you may have heard that the most successful privately funded fusion company in the world has spun out of the physics and astronomy department at UC Irvine. It's called TAE. Um, more than half a billion dollars venture capital. There's a real chance that in our lifetimes, we will have fusion energy be a reality, right? It's not a pipe dream. This is something that could really happen and could be fundamental. In addition, we have people in our school that are working on artificial photosynthesis, next generation battery technology, new technology based on quantum materials that could enable extremely low power, energy efficient electronics that will be, uh, that, that could spur an entirely new revolution. Of course, we're still also interested in the fundamental and understanding really basic questions about what the universe is made of. What about life on other planets and where is it? How do we find it? How do we characterize that life? And what does it mean if we do find life out there beyond the solar system? So there's so many fun and in inspirational things happening. We're also leaning in to this idea of casting a very wide net to collect that talent pool of a diverse population of people uh, just like California. You know, we, I think everybody on this campus understands that this is so important for us to do over the next uh, several years. Um, the school is doing fantastic. Last year, we approached almost $65 million in research funding. This is a transform this is a number that we've never come close to before. It's a fantastic number that is spurring all of this fundamental research that we're doing. We have 770 new students coming in next year. Uh, that we're really inspired by, that are ready to take the next step. Um, so uh, I could go on and on, and I'd, I'd kind of like to, but I'm going to make myself stop. I don't want to keep bragging about the school, but uh, it's, it's just been fantastic. But I, I don't want to do that because it's really, let's get to sort of the main event here, and I get to introduce uh, Stephen Ritchie. So Stephen Ritchie is a professor of civil and environmental engineering, and he's the director of UCI's Institute for Transportational Studies, fittingly. Um, he got his master's in engineering science and his BE at Monash University in Australia before getting his PhD at Cornell. Uh, Dr. Ritchie studies transportation systems engineering and is specifically interested in advancing traffic management and control systems. He serves as the founding editor-in-chief of the international journal Transportational Research Part C, Emerging Technologies. And today, he will tell us about UCI and the mobility revolution. Welcome. All right. Thank you, James, and good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure and a great honor to be with you tonight. It's been a terrific experience so far. Hopefully, it'll keep going that way with this talk. But it's been a real delight to meet so many of our former graduates. Uh, makes me feel kind of old when I meet the students that I taught me years ago for classes that I created, but it's really a thrilling experience to see how successful so many of you really are. So, so glad to be with you here tonight. Um, in keeping with the theme of this really spectacular venue, uh, my colleague, UCI alum, Daniel Hahn, who's going to come up in 10 minutes or so, uh, and I will try to tell you why this is the most exciting time ever to be involved in the field of transportation. And to a large extent, that's due to the revolution in mobility that we're all currently experiencing. Uh, to begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Institute of Transportation Studies, which I represent, as well as the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, we're part of a state unit um, created by the state of California back in 1947. Our mission is to be the premier university-based transportation research unit in the country. Uh, a lot of people don't like the gas tax, SB1, that was passed a year or so back. We love it because, I've got to tell you, <laughs> we, we receive about one and a half million dollars a year uh, through that which the state generously provided to the four branches of ITS. And the advantage really is that provides an ability for us to advise the state with whom we work very closely on longer term projects <clears throat> as opposed to the shorter term project by project, uh, usually disconnected type things that we tend to work on. Uh, 
at Irvine, ITS is one of the four branches, about 25 faculty and a disciplinary from across the whole campus. Um, we're the intellectual headquarters, if you will, for transportation education and research at UCI. We have, as I said, two dozen faculty, about 70 graduate students that we support each year. Um, research expenditures probably four million or so a year. And one of the characteristics of our research is that we do systems research, usually with a very strong uh, societal um, element and particularly environmental and air quality and equity as well as efficiency aspects. Some of the projects we've been, big projects we've been involved in recently, um, the first in collaboration with colleagues in the Advanced Power and Energy Program on campus. I know some of you are mechanical aerospace engineers and Professor Scott Samuelson, some of you may know, directs that program. Uh, the California Hydrogen Fuel Cell Initiative, uh, locations for future hydrogen refueling stations. Uh, we developed the California Statewide Freight Forecasting Model, which is one of the most advanced in the, in the country for any state. We're still developing and have implemented the California Truck Activity Monitoring System. It may sound kind of dry, but it turns out that before we developed this model, no one in the state, almost in the country, knew where trucks are at any point in time. And so, as some of you may know, certainly those of you who are civils, trucks create tremendous damage to highways as well as emitting uh, diesel trucks, at least particulate matter, which are really harmful to health. And so this is a very important activity. And we're also still running the state's natural gas vehicle incentive program, which is about a $22 million uh, program. So that's a little background, but uh, not the real point of tonight's presentation. What I'd like to do initially is touch on the transportation problem. Uh, many people speak of the problem as if there's one. Of course, there's not. But let's look at some of these characteristics in the real world. In, in California, we're part of a federal region. It's Region 9. It's the Pacific Southwest. And um, I mention this in the regional sense because we're part of a major center, uh, Pacific Southwest USDOT Research Center. California is a very major component of that. So there are four diverse states in our region, uh, including Pacific Island territories. We're home to eight metropolitan areas in excess of a million dollars, including, I'm sorry, a million people, including the nation's second largest and the nation's largest planning organization, which is here in LA, the Southern California Association of Governments. Four of the seven most visited cities, uh, four of the nation's 10 busiest airports, the largest high tech region. We've got the biggest port, LA and Long Beach. Uh, we have a really diverse state. Uh, in many respects, uh, the region has a, um, the largest high-tech uh, region uh, in the country, and we also have very sparsely populated and large desert regions, including uh, in, in the Pacific remote islands. We have a large volume of border crossings that brings a number of problems associated with it, uh, safety and a variety of other aspects. But in this state, as well as surrounding states, we also have concentrations of extreme wealth and extreme poverty and disadvantage. And in California, disadvantage is something that the state has actually objectively defined. So when you consider these attributes, what are the regional transportation issues we face? And I'll try to get through this relatively quickly. We have very rapid technological change, as we're all aware, right? Um, especially in transportation, but it's not occurring everywhere. It's mostly in the urban areas, uh, particularly Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, Sacramento. There's an issue of how to improve mobility and accessibility and economic opportunity for disadvantaged populations. We know that limited accessibility is an important uh, factor in unemployment and poverty. Uh, our transportation infrastructure, as well as our infrastructure in general, is vulnerable to natural and man-made hazards. And we have high growth, and there are issues. How do we finance uh, uh, solutions to cater to that growth, especially in travel demand? And then, of course, how do we reduce the impacts of our high-volume trade gateways, especially across the Mexican border and uh, at the ports? Well, concurrently with 
these issues facing us, we're experiencing this mobility revolution, which many think are going to help contribute to the solution of these problems. And for many years, um, like probably a hundred years, major technological innovations in transportation have fueled the growth of the US and many other countries. As we enter the 21st century, it's clear that we're experiencing this transformation of mobility or mobility revolution, and it's really fueled by two profound forces worldwide, really. The first you could call decarbonization of transportation, which is a very strong push from the public sector, especially in California. A lot of people will say, oh, that's just a California thing, but of course, the California Air Resources Board emission standards are followed by 13 other states and the District of Columbia, while they're still in force. Um, and so what happens in California really affects a very large segment of the country. And to address the challenges of climate change, greenhouse gases, air quality, uh, criteria pollutants, uh, finite supplies of carbon-based fuels, some of the reasons why our state in particular has been a leader in this area, and one of the goals is to create zero emission vehicles such as battery electric vehicles or fuel cell electric vehicles. The other force that is combining with decarbonization you could call digitalization, right? And this is largely a private sector driven force. Uh, advances in mobile communications, uh, mobile apps in particular, uh, real-time sensing technologies, and we have all embraced these technologies as has business. And this has led to the rapid development of connected and automated vehicles, uh, which continue to generate huge amounts of press and controversy uh, and hope for the future. Uh, new shared mobility concepts like ride hailing, Uber, Lyft, transportation network companies, uh, car sharing, bike sharing, all those collectively often called mobility as a service. Uh, and this is providing the foundation for smart cities of the future. And so, Together, this is creating an emerging field called transformational mobility. Okay, a little bit of a reality check, though. This transformation is occurring really rapidly, but we need to learn from perhaps the over-optimistic expectations and the recent events that we've witnessed. And some of them are listed on this slide. So we all hope for self-driving, well, maybe not all of us, but many of us hope for self-driving vehicles fairly soon. Right? Auto manufacturers and OEMs have promised this. Those timelines keep slipping, partly because of the AI and other elements uh, that are required for the success in this area. There are also no standardized safety regulations, which many in the auto industry think are impeding the, the development and also the cost of these technologies. Uh, Uber and Lyft recently announced huge losses, quarterly losses. Um, Uber was $5.2 billion. One can play with the numbers and, and end up with quite different numbers, but still it's a staggering uh, result. It may be temporary, growth is, is tremendous, but nevertheless very large losses. And from their own studies and reports, their services are increasing congestion and therefore pollution um, and vehicle miles of travel. And much of it is from deadheading vehicles traveling empty uh, from one location to another. We still have a lot of uncertainty in the US about connected vehicle technology. Some of you may know about DSRC, dedicated short range communications, or 5G as the two alternatives that are being advanced, and public agencies that will need to invest in these areas for vehicle to infrastructure. Communications <clears throat> don't know what to do. There's a chicken and egg situation. Should they invest and maybe turn out to be wrong, or not invest and be left behind? There's still considerable consumer anxiety about a number of issues, cost range and refueling infrastructure for battery electric vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, and then there's the issue of the grid, electric grid, and how we can make our grid renewable and what the demands will be when we go to uh, much higher levels of electrified transportation, especially in freight. Okay, so we argue that one of the issues is how we maximize the benefits now and during the transformation to these innovative mobilities. And we believe that we need 
to research sustainable deployment or staged pathways that meet traveler needs and to maximize societal benefits. If we abdicate responsibility to the private sector, and I'm not bashing the private sector, I know many of you work in these areas, uh, we will probably end up with solutions that are not optimal from a societal point of view. So we believe that we need greater research emphasis on system and societal perspectives, and then staged deployment so that we don't wait for the end state for self-driving vehicles, maybe in 10 or 20 years, but we capture as many benefits as we can now. How do we do that? Uh, pilot studies and field tests. We need to study travel behavior and preferences, what people will really use, uh, what they find useful. Uh, it's something, it's an area in which we really specialize. All the planning models that we have available to us now for infrastructure investment and trying to determine which modes people will use are basically redundant in the face of connected and automated vehicles and these new mobility options. So we need to develop new models for infrastructure investment. We need to look at different operating and pricing strategies because we'll have self-driving vehicles mixing with conventional vehicles with potentially safety aspects uh, involved there. We also need to address multimodal solutions and don't forget about transit because we have a huge investment and connected automated vehicles in particular can act as feeders first mile, last mile um, for those services. So I'm not going to go into this slide, but all of those elements are captured in the re research thrust that we have in our institute at ITS. And some of the new initiatives, and uh, Daniel is going to, uh, in his talk, mention one of those, but these are some of our new initiatives. We've created a transformational mobility living lab in ITS, which initially is focusing on three areas. The campus itself, uh, where we can basically do anything that our administration will allow us to because we're not subject to many of the state laws, DMV and so forth, on campus. But we also have an agreement with the city of Irvine. We're creating an intelligent transportation systems test bed on campus drive right in front of the campus. And we're in discussions now with the city of Irvine and AT&T to create 5G enterprise zone uh, in this area for testing of various technologies, including uh, LiDAR technologies and vehicle-to-vehicle, vehicle-to-infrastructure technologies. And we also, for several years, have had a test bed with the city of Anaheim testing uh, DSRC uh, vehicle-to-infrastructure technologies. And we've had our graduate students working on those projects, uh, Institute of Transportation Engineer projects, design projects, in which they've been very successful. Uh, we're launching a center for transformational mobility science uh, for the study of that area and to be a leader in that area. And we're uh, combining forces with our friends in APEP, Advanced Power and Energy Program, to create a new smart and sustainable mobility initiative bringing together renewable energy issues and smart mobility. So having said that, I'm going to bring on probably my better half um, and introduce you to uh, Mr. Daniel Hahn. And Daniel is a UCI alum. He spent the last 10 years in the automotive industry understanding car buyer behavior in order to grow marketing outreach and develop future products and launch new service offerings. Uh, he's currently the manager for new business innovation and strategy at Hyundai Motor America. And in this role, Daniel is focusing on identifying new business opportunities for Hyundai to extend its connection with consumers beyond private vehicle ownership. And he seeks out strategic partnerships, such as with UCI, in the public and private sectors to identify unique value and mobility solutions. Daniel's a graduate of UCI in economics with a minor in business, but we won't hold that against him. Uh, he also has an MBA from UCLA. I'm not so sure about that one, Daniel. Uh, anyway, thanks for your attention, and let me hand it over to Daniel. All right. So I want to start by uh, thanking Steve and the university for this opportunity as an alumni, although not an alumni of one of these schools, to, to speak to fellow alumni about some of the work that I'm doing. And then it's also a great honor for me to now be in the private sector and have an opportunity to partner with a school like UC Irvine. So it's 
it's a great opportunity for me to talk about this program, so hopefully you guys find it interesting. So I'm here to talk about a project that we're working on that's focused on the future, but I thought it'd be important for us to take a step back and talk about Hyundai and our past and why we're here and why we think it's important to think about the future. And so I start with this slide that really talks about Hyundai's DNA and, and our, our, our founder, what he believed in for the company uh, back in uh, 1947. It was really focused on being a challenger brand can-do spirit and just not being content with what we are and pushing forward and, and thinking of new innovation and thinking of new uh, value to create for our consumers. And so here in the United States, Hyundai is probably best known for our auto manufacturing and selling of vehicles. Uh, but that can-do spirit has led Hyundai to have 57 different business lines uh, focused on things like steel production, construction, anywhere from apartment buildings all the way to oil refineries. Uh, we make container ships, uh, we make trains. So really we have uh, this focus on a multitude of different uh, business lines uh, under the Hyundai umbrella. And so when we talk about Hyundai for the automotive industry specifically, we're actually fairly, fairly new. Uh, when you look at us compared to a lot of other OEMs, uh, we started in 1967 and in 1985 is when we first started selling vehicles here in the United States. And we started with one vehicle, it was the Hyundai Excel. And um, I can say definitely we've had a lot of ups and downs in the last uh, 30 years or so in this industry um, as we started with our humble beginnings of that one car. But as we fast forward to uh, our lineup today, in the last two years, we've had 10 either all new or significantly uh, redesigned vehicles uh, in our lineup. Uh, they range from a brand new uh, CUV like the Kona, uh, the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, uh, the Nexo, and then sporty cars like the uh, Veloster N. And for us, it's not about just making cars and focusing on designs, uh, but really we, we feel like there's pillars within our company that we like to focus on. And one of those is quality. And so for the last two years, we've been the uh, number two non-luxury brand in terms of the J.D. Power initial quality study. Uh, it's important to note the number one uh, non-luxury brand was Kia, which is our sister company. And the number one overall brand is Genesis, which is our luxury brand. Um, going beyond quality, there's also safety that we're really focused on for our vehicles. Uh, so we're really proud to say that we have 12 models currently that have either won the IIHS Top Safety Pick or the Top Safety Pick Plus, which is leading the industry. And we really think that focusing on things like quality, safety, and design has really culminated in a lot of prestigious awards that we've won. Um, I'm highlighting here the, the Kona and the Kona EV, which won the 2019 North American uh, Utility Vehicle of the Year. Um, it's also interesting to note the 2019 Car of the Year was the Genesis G70. So we've had a lot of momentum. Uh, we started with that one vehicle in 1985, um, and we're really proud of where we are today. And that brings us to what the future looks like for us. We think that although we're, we've had a lot of great successes, we have a lot of vehicles that we offer consumers, that there is a fundamental shift uh, occurring in the transportation industry today. And I use this framework, which is not original, there's a lot of people that talk about this, but I think that really focuses on what are the key areas that we need to focus on as a company that thinks about providing transportation uh, to our consumers. So I'll start with first, which is mobility. Um, I think we're all from Los Angeles, and so we could see on pretty much every sidewalk either e-scooters or bikes, um, and so they're very prevalent in terms of mobility solutions. I'm sure everyone in this room has taken Uber or Lyft uh, at one point in time, and then there's things like car sharing, um, companies like Zipcar, Turo, or Get Around, or there's a startup right here in our backyard in LA called Wavecar, which uh, Hyundai is partnered with. So they have like a very interesting car sharing model. So we're seeing a lot of change in terms of mobility uh, offerings uh, for consumers. The next is electrification. So actually electric vehicles have been around for over a hundred years, um, but we really feel like maybe the tipping point has come where Range anxiety is less of an issue, and charging infrastructure is getting better, and so that people are finding electric vehicles as more of a, of a solution for day-to-day -day transportation. And so for us, we have uh, 
two all EV vehicles in our lineup today, and we plan to grow that lineup um, with multiple vehicles in the future. The next is the, um, the idea of connectivity. Um, and we're seeing this in the home, uh, definitely with Amazon Alexa, Google Home, um, Samsung Bigsby. There's a lot of these personal assistants that you can find inside of your home. Well, we're also seeing that in, in the automotive industry too. For us, we have our telematic solution uh, called Blue Link. And so now from your phone, you could either lock or unlock your car, start your engine. Um, and so there's a lot of things that you can do in the digital space. And we think when we think about connectivity, that all those things that you could do in your home and all those things that you could do in your vehicle, that there is an opportunity to combine that and really think of a holistic solution. So we look forward to that in the future. And then finally, as Steve had mentioned, autonomous. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot of money being spent in this uh, uh, area of development. Um, we've done our fair share of investment in this area. We've, we've announced um, a lot of strategic partnerships with various companies in this area. And to Steve's point, I don't think we're going to see cars without steering wheels in the next few years, um, but I think that is definitely out in the future. And I think also exciting uh, in this area is a lot of the hardware that is required for this, you can find in your vehicles today. Uh, that provides things like automa automatic uh, brake assist or uh, collision warning or, or lane keep assist. And so um, we think it's coming. Uh, we're continuing to work on that. Um, and I think it provides a really interesting future. So those are the things that I think are happening in the industry that could impact our business in terms of providing transportation. So what are we planning to do uh, as an auto OEM to really take advantage of these trends and come out with those new solutions? For us, it really culminates into three different areas. First is new mobility solutions. So it's not about a single car that could provide a lot of different uh, uses for consumers, but thinking of either it's a vehicle or a service or a different mobility offering uh, that really allows consumers to have choice. Um, and so whatever their day-to-day -day needs are, um, if they want to take their car to a, a subway station and then take that to downtown, but then they need another form of transportation, maybe it's a scooter or something like that, how do we provide those different sorts of solutions for our consumers? The second area of focus for us is uh, a, a notion of multimodal planning. So now that there are all these types of mobility solutions, how do consumers cho choose? How do they figure out that I can take uh, the subway to downtown because I know that this e-scooter will be available for me and I can take that to my work. And so for us, it comes back to this idea of connectivity, bringing an ecosystem of all these different forms of mobility into one app solution. And so uh, we could be a part of that journey of giving you options of different uh, uh, mobility solutions. And then finally, uh, the area of access to mobility. So gone are the days where everyone goes to a dealer and they do a financing for their vehicle and they own it for five, six, seven years. Um, people are either leasing with much shorter terms or um, there's things like subscription. Um, and definitely we see this in a lot of other industries like digital content with Netflix or in the music industry uh, with uh, companies like Spotify. And so we really think that different forms of ownership uh, in areas of car sharing, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, or um, subscription um, are avenues where people can now have a different uh, avenue in terms of accessing mobility. So when we think about these different forms of mobility solutions that we're focused on, we realize that we can't do it by ourselves. We are an auto OEM, we have that specialty, but really it takes a lot of different stakeholders to uh, envision this future that I described. And so as a part of that, we work with a lot of different local uh, government municipalities uh, because ultimately they, they have their plans for what mobility looks like. Uh, they dictate things like whether there's two lanes for cars or one of those lanes um, goes away and it gets dedicated to, to bike lanes, let's say. And so really understanding what the, the city's goals are in terms of mobility transportation is very important to us. Uh, we also realize we can't do it by ourselves. Um, so we look for strategic technology partners, whether that's in a space where we feel like we don't have the technology and there's other experts, and so we're more than willing to admit that and find those strategic partners. 
or if it's becoming a part of a, a broader ecosystem. I mentioned, I mentioned things like Amazon Alexa, Google Home, uh, how do we kind of create that holistic experience? <clears throat> and then finally, the really important thing that I want to talk about today is uh, thinking about research universities like UC Irvine. Um, as we think about a total transportation solution and how we fit in to that overall puzzle, we think it's very critical to partner with schools like UC Irvine uh, to bring in those insights to help us understand where um, value lies for us and how we can be a part, again, of that larger ecosystem. And so, as Steve mentioned, we do have a pilot that we're working on. Unfortunately, I can't give too many details um, because we're still working on it. And uh, we will have a public announcement on November 1 that I can say about the project. Um, but this is what I can talk about right now. It is envisioning a new uh, mobility service uh, for consumers. Uh, and we really want to think about this as an end-to-end -end, uh, experience. Again, when we think about cars, um, typically it's about selling the car and then the person owns the car and then we don't have that interaction anymore. But we think, when we think about mobility services, it really is a day-to-day -day or minute-to-minute -minute interaction. And so how do we ensure that that is something that resonates with consumers and is the right fit? Um, and so <clears throat> that's the project that we're working on. Again, I apologize, I can't share too many details, but uh, again, November 1 is when we'll have a public announcement. So specifically focused on UC Irvine and ITS and what components have they been helping us in terms of understanding this pilot. First is writers, uh, understanding who the target writer is and what kind of value and we can bring to them and how do they think about their mobility solutions. Um, and then based on that, what are the insights and conclusions that we could help uh, that we can gain to help develop our business. The next area of, of uh, partnership is in terms of infrastructure. So I, I, again, understanding how our service could impact overall travel decisions uh, based on what local municipalities are thinking about as well as consumers. And then finally, bringing all of that together and tying that into an appropriate business model, uh, really understanding trade-off uh, of consumers in terms of what features they want or they don't want and um, creating value for our consumers. And so that's all I have today. Um, stay tuned for November 1. Uh, we'll have a lot more information on the pilot that we've been working on. So thank you very much. Right, we're getting close to the end, but I want to give these guys time. Please give them another round of applause. Uh, given the time of the session, we're going to, if you have questions, we, we have our individuals up here up front, and you can come up and ask questions then. The night is not over, though. Uh, we have our desserts out in the foyer there, and those of you who've been to these events before, the desserts are always outstanding. Tonight will not be a disappointment uh, there as well. Uh, lastly, I do want to thank all of you for coming out tonight and for continuing to be supporters of this school, of the School of Engineering of the School of Information and Computer Sciences, and of the School of Physical Sciences. We look forward to seeing you many more times at our upcoming events, and we look forward to engaging you. As we depart, as always is customary, we do so in our affectionate call and response. And so, You know, all great universities have a call and response. For those of you who may not know, this is the anteater. And remember, you have to curl your fingers back to form the snout. That's not an anteater. That's a wolf pack. This is an anteater. And so we're going to ask you to put them up.
And on the count of three, we give three loud, thunderous, zot, zot, zots. On the count of three. One, two, three. Zot, zot, zot. Thank you.